Have you ever wondered what it took to put together a Trump rally? Tens of thousands of people descending on a city. George Jijikos was there before day one. He ran all the rallies for President Trump during his campaign. I'm going to sit down and ask him what it takes to put a rally together, how it all came together. Why does Elton John's Tiny Dancer end with those rallies? It's got a big rally this weekend in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There are 19,000 seats in this rally with over a million people are <laughs> have, have asked for tickets. Uh, a lot goes into one of these rallies. I, I wanted to talk to George Jijikos. George, you were part of Team Trump before it was even Team Trump. Tell me, how did you get involved with the campaign and how did the idea for the first rally come to be? Hey, Sean, good to see you. Uh, sure. I uh, was summoned to New York by Corey Lewandowski uh, to plan a press conference in Trump Tower. Uh, I had heard rumblings that Mr. Trump was thinking about running for president, but at the time, I did not know that it was going to be his announcement. So I went to New York and we, we got the gist of what we wanted to do. He was very intent on doing it in Trump Tower in the atrium. So that was the announcement. Uh, that same day, we did the announcement. We took off went to Des Moines and uh, did an announcement there that evening. Came back to New York, went to New Hampshire the next day, and that was the beginning of it all. So how did this idea of rallies, like, like, when did you realize that there was something there? I mean, I've been to political rallies, and it's usually not towards the end of a campaign that you get thousands of people to show up. So, you know, you've been doing this a while. How did you, when did you realize, hey, we got something that's different. And most, most candidates go out there and press the flesh. Trump sort of said, you know, instead of necessarily doing all this retail politics, I'm going to do big rallies all the time. Yeah, right. Well, we, you know, we started off in Iowa and New Hampshire like everybody, right? Uh, other candidates, we were in a field with, what, 19 other candidates, and we'd go to high schools and gyms, and they'd go to Elks Clubs and get, you know, 25, 30 people. We would go to a high school and reserve the gymnasium, but then we'd also have to reserve the cafeteria and the hallways and everything else because so many people came to see him. We were getting crowds in New Hampshire, you know, that were unheard of before Donald Trump. Uh, the first rally we did we started off in, in, in uh, Phoenix, and we just went to the, I think, it was Phoenician and got a little ballroom. We quickly outgrew that. We went on Eventbrite, did our tickets, outgrew it. We moved it to the convention center where we had, you know, thousands of people show up. And that was the start of the really, you know, rallies kind of as we know them now. Uh, early on, we would typically go to Iowa on Mo Monday, New York Tuesday, New Hampshire Wednesday, New York Thursday, then Friday we would pick someplace, you know, off the beaten track that nobody was really going to. So How he long? decided one Friday that he wanted to go, he wanted to go south. And we decided on Mobile, Alabama. And everybody, nobody could figure out why are we going to Mobile, Alabama in August of 2015. And, you know, we're running a 50 state campaign. And, you know, the, the crowds were coming. Let's try it down south. So we went to Mobile and we reserved the Civic Center, 2,600 seats, thinking, hey, if we get 2,600 people on a Friday night in Mobile, we're doing pretty good. That ended uh, first day. We had 10,000 requests for tickets. We moved it to the arena. By Wednesday, we had you know 50,000 ticket requests. I got there on Thursday. We moved it to the football stadium. And that was the first big Trump mega rally, which in August of the year prior to the election is unheard of. We had... 30, 40,000 people show up. Did you need tickets back then or could you just show up? So that, that was really the start of, you could just show up. You need it, we go on Eventbrite, ticket out. But, but uh, for the most part, you know, just show up. Okay, and and so how did you guys start to brand these the way they are now where you've got, you know, they, they all look very similar, right? That you've got the Make America Great banners, you've got the flag, but there's sort of a cookie cutter look to each of them. How did that come to be? Well, when we went, go to an arena, right, they're all pretty much the same. There's one way to set it up. You can't get fancy. Uh, it's hard to make anything look bad with 20,000 screaming people holding up rally signs and, and going crazy when, when they see Mr. Trump. Uh, they are cookie cutter. Uh, you know, back in 2016, our staff was so small and so limited that – you know, we were bouncing around left and right. You know, for the longest time, I was the only advancing on the campaign. 
uh, had four or five people helping me and we were bouncing around pulling these scenes together on such short notice. Uh, you know, in the arenas, you know, where I was always a few days ahead trying to get vendors lined up and, and, and the space rented and all that. Later on in the campaign, we got a good rhythm going on how to do it. But, you know, the banners and everything we had, I think early on we had four banners made and we were just shipping them from town to town and, and reusing them. And, you know, make America great. That's enough said. That and 20,000 people with rally signs sends a pretty positive message of about, you know, how his message is resonating with people. There's nothing better than a Trump rally, as you've seen. How, how long does it take you to, how long, I mean, I'm not talking back then, but like on a day like today, for the one that's happening this weekend, how long does it take to plan that event logistically? Uh, well, I'll tell you, they're a little bit different than they were in 2016. Today, you know, Mr. Trump, would we would see lines, people camping out. You know, you have the front row Joes that would show up the second the rally was announced in the town. And Mr. Trump got very concerned early on, you know, in this cycle that so many people were waiting in such long lines. So the rallies have really evolved and now they're more like festivals yeah. outside before they open the gates. So now we have, you know, we have uh, the Trump team has their, their uh, online thing that they do. Uh, there's music, there's food trucks. So it's a real festival atmosphere, which adds to a lot of the work. Because remember, you're still in a secure perimeter when you're doing these things. So, you know, we were pulling these things off in three or four days. Now, I think they're going about 10 days. How much of this, you know, you mentioned the, the online piece of this. I don't think people fully appreciate how much data is gathered at one of these rallies. Yeah, there's a lot of data that, you know, when, when people are in line, and you've seen the lines, they're massive. They're miles long sometimes. Like, in, I think in Tulsa, they're already lined up. They've been lined up for a couple of days now. And the campaign does a very, very good job of capturing data from those people that are here because we can use that data later on in, in reaching out for voter turnout and getting out the vote and everything else. So, you know, um, whenever you watch a Trump rally, there's, the, the music is interesting. You got Elton John or whatever. Who chose all this music? I mean, I, I would assume you go to a rally or a festival, it's people getting pumped up with, you know, all sorts of music. But they always end with Tiny Dancer by Elton John. What, what, what's, is that, is that completely, you know, uh, Donald Trump? Uh, the playlist is, is one of a kind. The playlist is chosen by Mr. Trump. And the music is in the order in which he wants it. And, you know, it works well. It is exciting. It's fun. Uh, you know, these rallies have become known for the playlist. <laughs> in addition to everything else, the playlist is a very, very important part of the rally. So, uh, George, is there something that, like, what's the what's something that people the either that that go to a rally or that are watching a rally don't understand that goes into it that you would that you could explain that's sort of it really interesting that you wouldn't have an idea behind the scenes that's happening. You know, like you said earlier, they're they're kind of we take the cookie cutter approach, but behind the scenes, it's a little bit different now that he's president than he was when he was a candidate. Before we even had Secret Service, you know, we had we had our excellent security from from the organization. Uh, once Secret Service kicked in, the intensity of the security got a little bit more uh, intense to to keep him safe as well as the attendees safe. Uh, so there's a lot to go behind the scenes with that. Uh, just his movements, uh, the magnetometers. You know, once we got Secret Service, everybody had to go through metal detectors. So there's a lot of stuff that goes behind the scenes with that stuff last time around. This time around that he's president, we have a whole other, whole other component involved as far as you know, dealing with communications wherever the president goes and Air Force One and you know, a much higher level of security but he is the president. Having said that, they've done a very, very good job of not letting that really hinder the appearance of the rally to the average person watching. There's a lot going on in the scenes but it still has the same energy, if not more. Uh, you know, there's very, very, from what people can see, there's not much change in the energy music and in, uh, in the closeness, the way he can connect with everybody. And, you know, but you know, there's stuff that goes behind the scenes, you know, the planning, the, the meticulous planning that goes into these things. Uh, from the time they announce it, you've got to find the venue, you've got to work with the local party and local campaign staff. Uh, you know, the, usually the city government involved, the municipal government. Uh, so there's a lot of people that get involved in addition to, you know, our own Secret Service and, and military and communication folks and, 
then you have the whole media component too and making sure that the media has what they need to cover the event with as far as the press riser and the malt box and, and all that stuff. Is there any uh, secret to getting a ticket or getting a good spot in, in the venue? Well, I think the tickets, you go online to uh, donaldtrump.com and get the tickets. And, you know, you, you go online and you print it out and you take it. Uh, to get in and to get a good seat, you need to get there early, man. It's, you know, like I said, people would show up, you know, sometimes they're there before they're there. Uh, lined up, camped out. Uh, there's a following, like I said, front row Joe's. And, you know, as soon as the rally is announced, they get in their cars, they carpool, they, they, they all show up, they share hotel rooms. It's really amazing. Yeah. You got to get there early and get in line. Okay. Early in the night. Okay. Uh, and and I'll tell you, a great thing that, a good thing that the campaign is doing now, and we started it back when, but, you know, we were limited with budgets and everything else in 2016. But a really good thing they're doing now is, in addition to the 20, 25,000 people that can get inside, they're setting up jumbotrons outside. So there's the same carnival atmosphere outside that there is inside now. And, you know, sometimes the president will go outside too and rally those people. Do you think um, if you were in this position heading into this Tulsa rally, how much of an impact would, would the COVID issue have on the planning and what we needed to do to make sure it was a safe event for those going inside? Well, I think it needs to be in the front of everybody's mind. We, we still are in a pandemic. I think the campaign's doing the right thing by providing masks and hand sanitizer and, and, and all, you know, but the fact of the matter is there's still a pandemic there. Uh, I know that the campaign is coming under fire from the other side for having this rally, which I think is nonsense. Uh, you know, it's okay. We had tens of thousands of people protesting the last couple of weeks, and nobody was saying anything about that. The fact that that all of a sudden this rally has become an issue is beyond me. I think if people practice good hygiene and wear their mask and wash, keep their hands washed, you know, I think it'll be fine. We got to get back to normal. Yeah. Um, George, thank you for, uh, for sharing this insight. It's going to be fascinating to see how this rally goes down. And, and so I appreciate you giving us a behind the scenes look at, at how these rallies go down. Yeah, man. Good to see you. All right. Take care, George. Thanks a lot. George Dijikos, everybody. Well, thanks to George for sharing us all the insight and what it takes to put one of those rallies together. Take some time, put a comment down below. Let me know if there's another topic or a person that you want to hear from. We'll see what we can do about either covering that or reaching out to them. Subscribe to the channel. Hope to see you back.